Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine V13. This is our 13th event. Excited to be talking about all things parachains, interoperability, and the Polkadot ecosystem at large. I'm your host, Roshan Marajpar from the Mouse Belt team. And today, our panel will be discussing the future of legacy systems. Really excited to be here with the guests for today. And let's uh, start by welcoming our guests and giving the chance to, uh, for, for them to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start with you, Adam. Um, hello, I'm Adam Longo. I represent Aleph Zero Team. We are building a substrate-based um, chain focusing on uh, high-speed and throughput. And right now we are working on our internal privacy framework. Um, we are using substrate, so we are naturally part of the Polkadot ecosystem, although we are not parachain right now. And as we use, are using different consensus protocol, uh, we cannot be uh, parachain using the current uh, set of rules, uh, but we still see each other uh, partially, at least as a, as a part of the entire ecosystem. We are planning to integrate pretty close to, to the other, uh, other chains uh, building here. Yeah, awesome. Next we have TJ. Hey everyone, I'm TJ. Um, I'm part of the ICON team, which is a layer one blockchain that is fo focused specifically on interoperability. So we do on-chain trustless verification. And more specifically, kind of related to this conference, we have um, an extension network that is being built called the ICE blockchain, which is built on the substrate SDK and is kind of focused on the same kind of ethos cross-chain interoperability, but specifically, you know, combine this broader ICON B2P ecosystem with the Polkadot parachain ecosystem. Awesome. And lastly, we have Fabian. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Uh, I'm Fabian. I'm the co-founder of uh, Kaif Network. Um, we are building a fully decentralized Web3 um, data lake. Um, although our uh, application logic is not a parachain, we have integrated with um, a lot of them out there. And basically what we are doing is we are making sure that we can basically move all the data from like any application or any app chain, any blockchain really through Web3 to other chains. And you as a developer kind of have the freedom to work with um, all the data um, out there. 100%, uh, great to have you all here. And without further ado, let's jump into the panel. Excited to talk to you all. Uh, I think at first, let's kind of break down uh, overall, I want to get your guys' thoughts on either why you guys chose to build on the Polkadot infrastructure or why you're building, um, you know, something that's uh, compatible across, like kind of a multi-chain infrastructure. Uh, like, what's the value in that? Let's explain it to our audience here. I'll go to you first, Adam. Um, so I think I'd like to divide it into two separate questions. So. I think for us, the main driver was not actually to become part of the ecosystem, but rather to use a framework which uh, will allow us to not, instead of building everything from scratch, to build uh, upon others' work. So uh, back when we've been starting, there have been only two such frameworks, and I think it's, it's roughly still the case. This is Substrate and uh, Cosmos Educates. Uh, Substrate is uh, is developed by Parity, and it's it's a very modular framework for setting up your own blockchain. It's in Rust, and Cosmos is the case in Go. So, like for us, the decision was actually pretty simple. We've been coding in Rust. Substrate is a um, Rust framework, so uh, so it was it was pretty obvious that that's something we'd like to use. And uh, so far, we are super happy with our choice. I mean, right now, if we would, if, like, when we're, I'm imagining that we would have to build everything by ourselves, like explorers, wallets, uh, I don't know, like network layers, all of this part of, uh, uh, of the code that is required, but where we don't actually want to introduce our own innovations, that would probably take years to develop. And uh, here we get like all of these things for free. So. That's how we found our way into into the ecosystem by just choosing uh, choosing the substrate SDK and building with it. Uh, and like there are multiple multiple things which are coming with this choice. So first is that we are we have access to all this nice tooling, uh, both for for users and and developers. And the other thing is that it's much easier for us to integrate with um, some other chains. Uh, we strongly believe that the future is interchain, so, so we care a lot about integrations. And well, since we are building with this framework, it's naturally closer for us to uh, 
to integrate with other chains using that. As I mentioned a moment before, uh, it's a bit tricky for us to become a parachain, although we are still exploring exploring the ways uh, of getting into this uh, parachain ecosystem. We don't have a final internet decision yet, so maybe I'm not, uh, I'm not fit this particular part, but, but we are very interested uh, in, in becoming part of this. Uh, of this ecosystem, which actually I see as one of the only two currently existing ecosystems where the other is, as mentioned before, Cosmos. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I definitely have noticed that in the Polkadot ecosystem, like a lot more collaboration and people are not like just creating new things for the sake of creating it. I think it's pretty cool. I'll move to you next, TJ, if you want to break down, you know, like your, your team's affiliation just with uh, polka dot or even just building on uh, uh, you know for a multi-chain uh, infrastructure yeah so i think um specifically for ice kind of the first reason why this sister chain uh, was going to be built is icon has java smart contracts is, and is built on the jvm so uh obviously in this industry being evm compatible is kind of a must and that was kind of where we initially um, had the idea for the sister chain. And then uh, we actually, we knew that we wanted a chain. So that kind of um, took away a lot of options already instead of just, you know, building an application on top of a existing um, monolithic blockchain uh, using something like the Cosmos SDK or Substrate SDK. And as Adam kind of explained that Substrate SDK just has so much uh, great tooling and is modular in the fact that um, it's just a great development experience. So um, that was kind of the initial reason for, for choosing the Polkadot ecosystem. And then um, more broadly, being able to use the Substrate SDK allowed us to really optimize for what we wanted to do with the pair chain or um, which was cross-chain interoperability. So uh, being able to, you know, uh, modify the Substrate SDK to, um, optimize for, you know, decreased transaction costs for um, these cross-chain swaps and stuff like that. And then um, just the, the whole layer zero infrastructure of Polkadot allowing for the shared security. And then I think kind of the main, main thing as well was um, XCMP. So we wanted to be interoperable with all, all the other pair chains within the ecosystem. Um, but we also wanted to connect all those pair chains through ours to um, uh, L1s that are outside of the broader ecosystem. So I think just in general, yeah, like the developer support is great, the docs are great, and, and that kind of just allowed for the team to um, have a, a pretty, pretty well development experience. Yeah, we're seeing all these new technologies that are coming out, like yeah, XCM that, it's, that is enabling like more interoperability, more communication. Uh, inside the Polkadot network, it's pretty cool. I'll move to you next, Fabian, for kind of the next question. Maybe if you want to talk about, uh, you know, in, in, in your view, do you think there's anything special or does Polkadot stand out in terms of how will legacy uh, companies uh, kind of plug into crypto? Like, will it be through this multi-chain um, infrastructure? Yeah, I would say absolutely, because um, that's also quite of like the, the tech journey, I would say we have done at Kive. So we started out actually being fully Arweave based. So Arweave is a, is a storage kind of like only blockchain, so to say, right? And actually then we realized, well, this kind of like monolithic, like one chain rules all kind of use case. It's not something that's gonna be like kind of sustainable for the future because we do, I mean, we see it in web two, right? It's like, we do see that the architecture has changed into like microservices, right? It's like you write dedicated services for dedicated use cases. And so we thought, well, we should kind of apply the same idea to, to the web three space. And then actually we started separating out all of our token um, or chain logic, right, to an EVM contract and actually deployed on Moonbeam, um, which quite like got us in touch with all the, uh, the Polkadot and, and Parachain ecosystems. Um, but then for us, we kind of realized, well, actually, the flaw with EVM, it really didn't fit with kind of like Kive's idea because EVM works quite well for like those low throughput but high value transactions. Let's say on Uniswap, right? If you make like $10,000 profit on your Uniswap trade, well, you're fine with like paying $300 in gas right, or $100 in gas, for example, right? Because those apps are able to share like the block space with other applications, right? 
And then we realized, well, actually at Kaif, we would need like a dedicated app chain to make sure that we don't share, right, the block space we have available with other applications. And then, right, this has torn us to this app chain approach where basically now our logic lives on like the dedicated, on, on a dedicated chain, right? And we, of course, can then optimize for that use case. So our kind of like tech stack looks like that. We are storing all the data on Arweave, like the storage optimized chain, right? And having all the, the token and chain logic staking delegation and so on, right? Happening on like a dedicated app chain. You could do the exact same with the parrot chain, right? The only reason why we got torn towards Cosmos was because I think Adam said that they were a team of Rust developers and for us Go was right the the, um, the choice. So we kind of went with, with that system. And then also kind of like working with like the other parrot chains is something then where right of the demand for Kaif, right? Was, was a bit torn with like, well, now we have our dedicated like space where we can work in, right? Which is kind of like isolated, but now how do we like work with other ecosystems, right? How do we get our data in and out, right? And how do we kind of like optimize for storage? Because one thing you do with like having those those dedicated parachains, app chains, right? You're gonna ramp up the, the use for storage. And this is kind of then where Kaif comes in and we've partnered with Moonbeam, for example, right? Or with Composable Finance and others, right? To make sure and get their data into our data lake and then kind of from there being able to kind of like source this in a more interruptible way, right? Then it really doesn't matter where you've built your app chain. Is it, is it Cosmos? Is it a parachain? Then it's kind of like really up to the teams of like where they would like to, to optimize most in, I would say. And so it's like, it's really cool to see like how you have those different ecosystems all around, all kind of like evolving around the same concept of like, well, yeah, we need to optimize for our use case much better than, than you could do in EVM before. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective on just specialization uh, within the application, within the ecosystem. I think that's that's pretty cool. And there are ways like parachains or people in the ecosystem to kind of uh, share resources, work with each other. I'll go to you next, TJ, if you want to give some perspective on, you know, uh, maybe from the enterprise angle or just these maybe these larger companies. Like, how do you believe they will connect uh, to all the things, the innovation? You know, will it be through something like Polkadot multi-chain where they can just do everything at once um, or will they try to like do something more siloed? Yeah, I think um, obviously we haven't saw um, extreme enterprise adoption yet. Um, and probably a lot of that reason is just through regulation and stuff. But um, with, with the amount of like tooling and, and teams dedicated towards actually kind of catering to this experience for enterprises, I think that eventually we will see a lot of them kind of coming on to uh, whether it's like their own parachain or um, using any, any type of framework. Um, I definitely expect them to use a framework that allows them to have, you know, shared security and built-in interoperability, uh, just as those are extremely complex things to build and um, unless, you know, they have a dedicated team towards also working on that, it's probably unlikely that they will be. But um, I mean, specifically, even for Polkadot, it makes a lot of sense um, with the layer zero architecture and using that shared security. And then, you know, with, with XCMP, they'll be able to communicate um, with basically whatever enterprise that they, they want to interact with. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see, too, uh, what what type of like cross-chain messaging optimizes for like privacy. Um, like a lot of, a lot of different companies, um, you know, don't want to be sharing like sensitive information and stuff like that. So um, I think privacy has always kind of been on the top of people's minds since even like the last uh, cycle, but uh, for, for enterprises to really, you know, adopt this technology, I think it's kind of a must when it comes to, you know, like healthcare and pharmacy and, and other things of that nature. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting applications and that's kind of what I, what I want to go into next, like talking about what are the applications, use cases that people can actually use right now on kind of in the Polkadot ecosystem to gain some of these benefits. So yeah, I'll go to you, Adam, if you kind of want to, um, you know, talk about, I, I, I know you, your team is involved in building like one of the most used dApps on Polkadot. So uh, yeah, explain to our audience a bit, maybe like what you're specifically building, how does that contribute um, to the Polkadot ecosystem and what are some of the things you look for when like building, you know, new features? Uh, so like I see our team more as building chain, which means that uh, we are more on providing infrastructure than building an actual DAP. 
Uh, yes, we do have on our roadmap uh, some user uh, user facing applications as well. But like the, the biggest value that we are trying to bring uh, bring to the ecosystem is the value given to other developers rather than to end users. So uh, what besides the, the chain, what we are right now building is called Liminal, and that's a privacy framework, and that's a framework framework that will be, of course, given to developers. Uh, to, to build smart contract with. Uh, actually, I could talk a lot about this, uh, but I think that's uh, that's a bit different out of the scope of this of this call. But, but like uh, different kinds of privacy. So uh, so I would say that when it comes to actual uh, DApps that are used, my personal opinion is that the Polkadot ecosystem is still in pretty early stage in this regard. Uh, comparing to, to uh, for example, Cosmos ecosystem, so uh, we do have several uh, parachains which are very promising. But when it comes to comes to the killer app, I, I I would say that still we are waiting for the killer app in the um, in the Polkadot ecosystem. Even not when it, not only when it comes to uh, the original ideas that have not been present in other ecosystems, but also um, the that is ideas which are very much present right now. What we see is that mostly used apps are uh, are on probably Moonbeam, and that's because it's EVM compatible and it's very easy to uh, to move them from uh, from Ethereum. So when it comes to novel Polkadot uh, based killer app, I I'd say that we need to wait for perhaps another six to twelve months. Sure, and I'll, and I'll zoom out a bit too, Adam, if you want to kind of continue this question, like even just Polkadot aside, what do you, what do you think like multi-chain applications, like what's the real benefit? Is there any killer use case for something like that? You know, for example, I know there's a, uh, I believe it's called a USD, I think like Akala, a decentralized uh, stable coin. So do you think it will be things like stable coins or is it DeFi that you know, just anyone can benefit um, from from those applications, like it being uh, kind of multi-chain rather than centralized. Definitely, from the reasons which <laughs> obviously we already we all know, we are still waiting for the good uh, decentralized stablecoin. There was one uh, candidate which uh, just fell apart. Uh, Couple of weeks weeks ago, uh, so yes, I I expect there will be uh, multiple pretenders like a USD USN uh, brought by Nier, for example. I think it's also it will be a strong competitor. So yes, I think the stablecoin, perhaps the uh, common stablecoin standard, which would be used uh, on multiple chains and which will not be uh, necessarily backed by reserves, just like USDT or USDC. Yes, that's uh, that's what I think I, I would uh, I would expect to be the first uh, big uh, interchain uh, feature. Uh, what I personally dream about is the, uh, the stablecoin with privacy features. So I think this would be a killer app for for users. So right now we do have some privacy uh, privacy coins, but uh, like. I haven't seen a big and popular pri uh, privacy-related stablecoin, and I think for for a regular user, which would like just to use the coin for for his own transactions, that's something the user would like. It's a very uncommon feature for a financial system, but you can peek into some somebody's wallet just because this person interacted with you. That's not <laughs> what users want. But that's what's there only because of of the technical limitations of the current blockchain. So um, I'd say that the first reasonable, in our first big interchain application will be a stablecoin, and the first killer great application will be private stablecoin. Yeah, no, I think great answer. I mean, how cool would that be? I think it would solve a lot of problems in the ecosystem if there's just one stablecoin that everyone was working on uh, across a different chain. Uh, move to you, T TJ. I don't know if you have any thoughts here, like similar thoughts. You know, in your view, like what do you think? Uh, you know, cross-chain, when it comes to cross-chain application, like what's the most valuable thing someone could build? What would you like to see built? Yeah, I think um, as the industry has become more multi-chain and um, we, have, we have a ton of bridges springing up, we saw just a huge issue with like liquidity fragmentation. 
So, um, you know, you can have a DEX that has um, wormhole USD and then um, layer zero, you, like basically every bridge has its own wrapped version of um, uh, the same coin and they uh, turn from fungible tokens into like non-fungible tokens, essentially that you can trade with each other. And um, there are DeFi applications that are working on um, kind of fixing that. But I think something inter interesting is um, right now with kind of like, you know, uh, interoperability, a lot of people are talking about token bridging and that kind of being the main use case. But I think um, similar with XCMP uh, and what BTP is trying to do is really just any arbitrary data transfer will allow for you know this like liquidity fragmentation issue to be solved um whether that means all these native assets kind of just staying on their 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 origin chain and um through message routing being able to uh you know be able to find the optimal route for a swap and and stuff like that and i think stuff like that will allow the industry to you know have deeper liquidity and hopefully stuff like like omni-chain um, token standards where like if all the pair chains were on the same token standard and using um, an omni-chain standard for this AUSD, then um, they, they would be fungible between chains using XCMP. So I think kind of the biggest issue that, I, like I said, is liquidity fragmentation from my mind. So I hope that that's something that um, can be solved yeah, no, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people aren't really thinking in, in that framework. Like they're just building their application, and then when it comes to like bridging it out or or making it interconnected with other applications, it's still very tough. Um, I'll let you, Fabian, kind of end this question out if you have any thoughts here from from your perspective. I just actually would absolutely agree with with TJ and Adam. I think like coming like. Maybe wrapping it up from like the, the start of like the enterprise idea, right? And I do agree with both. It's like ideas like healthcare and like those big enterprise companies and bringing it on Web3 is, is awesome, right? But the, the kind of like counterintuitive thing is that the moment we actually roll out a blockchain, everything is suddenly public, right? It's like we do need the privacy and it's like a big like compliance issue, right? Because like I personally didn't want my all my healthcare stuff to live on a public blockchain. And like the moment my address would be identified, right? anyone would know what kind of like healthcare stuff I have or like, or anything else It's actually something we, we want, we need to prevent. Right. And that's actually where the big compliance part comes in from enterprises, like making sure to not leak your data. Right. And so I think this is something we are still missing actually kind of having those kind of like privacy um, things there, which are well decentralized, right. But still kind of like hinder you from, from seeing into, into all of these things. And then also from there, I think, very also kind of like ties in with with compliance and everything It's like the only reason why I would like to use like Uniswap, for example, right, on different ecosystems right now is because I do trust the brand, right, and I do maybe have done some research and saw that, for example, Uniswap is like the best audited um, like decks out there. So I would, for example, know where my funds are safe there, right, and it's a cool thing. And I think why we see so many like EVM compatibility uh, parrot chains and stuff kind of popping up, right, because then I could just one click deploy Uniswap. On, on like on uh, on Moonbeam, for example, right? And I would see, well, I'm kind of porting over the trust from like the Ethereum ecosystem to the Polkadot ecosystem, right? Although I think we would all agree from a technical perspective, it would be of course even better if I would implement Uniswap natively, right? Into like the, the parachain framework. But I, but I don't do this because I know that the stuff I wrote for Ethereum will work one-on-one -on, -one on the on the parachain and it's audited and it's secure, right? So this is kind of like what also would tie in that this idea of like this, this stable coin, this interoperable stable coin, interoperable DeFi is I think pretty cool because then you could have one big player that's really like focusing on security, right? Really maybe focusing on privacy and so on. And then I, as like a, an enterprise, I don't need, have to worry about how do I get liquidity into my ecosystem? How do I get additional security into my ecosystem? How do I get audited and so on, right? If I could just send my tokens to well, the partner that is like dedicated to that, which I can really trust, right? Just set my assets over there, and then users can use this, and I know it's best for my users and for myself, right? To kind of have this have this thing going on. I think this is just something still missing, and something we will see kind of like some big killer apps for sure coming up if someone is able to kind of like pull this off in a in a very secure um, way. I, I just think it's a big win for all ecosystems out there. Hundred percent, and I like how each of you kind of covered a, a different topic about you know what you think some of the current problems are. Um, I, I want to kind of.
talk about uh, one more one thing open ended, and then we'll move to the last question. So we've seen like Polkadot be pretty prevalent at Davos this year, and I've read some articles just talking about you know like the future of Web three, the infrastructure. What will it be built on? You know, will it be EVM? Will it be something else? So kind of just want to get everyone's general thoughts here on. Like, what would a future world look like if more things were um, built on Polkadot? And is there any specific things that come to your mind when thinking about, you know, uh, is there any benefits for like governments uh, or those types of uh, people to, to use something like Polkadot first rather than um, something like Ethereum? Um, I'll start with you, Adam. Um, so I... I see two things here, like one is EVM related and the other is governance related. Uh, so when it comes to governance, I think it's uh, perhaps like what's unique uh, or almost unique in Polkadot ecosystem because there's other ecosystems in Cosmos is that uh, you can easily like create um, independent but well-connected part which is not possible um, in Ethereum. So like, uh, and in this part, you can define how would you like uh, the governance to look like. And as it's modular, and actually Polkadot is focusing a lot on governance, there are modules which you can adopt, change some hyperparameters and set up the governance however you like it. So I, I think this is perfect for such um, perhaps official or government related, related cases that you, you can have a consortium chain, which uh, perhaps could be a part chain, but ne not necessarily. Uh, it can be uh, can be just bit using the SDK. And then you can uh, define who is voting for what, and, if, uh, and you can define the hyperparameters for such a voting. I think uh, when it comes to this um, modular governance, let's say, um, as far as I know, Polkadot perhaps is the um, furthest uh, in, this, in this frontier, is pushing the frontier, frontier the furthest. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's uh, I, I'm not surprised about the Davos thing and that Polkadot is, is so profound. Uh, when it comes to EVM, I think that's something we'll be covering in the next question. So uh, I expect that it's this. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll move to you, Fabian, if you want to give your thoughts uh, on your perspective on this. I can just absolutely agree with um, with with kind of Adam on it. I think that the future will be those like app specific um, use cases right have we seen as we've just discussed right just because it gives teams more flexibility uh more ease of use right you're not dependent on like an l0 system right if i build on like an evm i'm always gonna be basically yeah reliant on some third party kind of operating like the evm compatible chain right it'd be like moonbeam or something like that like if i build my d app it's like i have to build like a solidity contract out of it, right? I have to write it there. It like kind of hinders me. I don't have the flexibility I do get with the new uh, toolkits out there from Polkadot. Um, and then the cool thing is like you can always kind of like extend, right, on the SDKs. Um, I think Adam says, right, like, like they've used the SDK. And Adam, correct me if I'm wrong on that, right? But if you've used the SDK, SDK as like a base, but modified that way that it's not parachain compatible, right? But you're still sourcing from so many already existing tooling out there, it's still a benefit for you, right? Like using it over some other solutions out there, which I think is just for sure gonna be the next kind of like entry point for developers, right? Looking at this and like being able to like, yeah, be more flexible in development, even also working with like more, uh, I would say easy to get, because that's also something we, we tend to forget, right? It's like solidity, if you write like on an EVM thing, is something a developer has to like learn from scratch, right? While well, Rust is used very rightly in the in the industry, right? Or Go, which is around for for years, right? And it's much easier to find developers for your team, right? Being able to to build things with that, except of like having to like re-educate your developers, you would get in the team completely new to Solidity, for example. Yeah, I think I, I think it's quite interesting how you know there's there's a lot of developers that know these other programming languages and they're kind of slowly learning about. Polkadot first compared to just learning uh, Solidity. Um, I think lastly, T TJ, if you want to end on this question and then I'll take us out on the last one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with both previous answers and um, instead of kind of, I guess, reiterating all of what they're saying, I think just the, the main part is the, the framework that, um, you know, that Polkadot has been providing. Um, as said, just the the ability to use this tooling, um, have the flexibility 
to um, optimize your chain for basically any specific use case and then have built-in security and uh, like cross-chain messaging basically you know allows not not only these governments but um, basically any company to um, kind of you know build for for what they're they're supposed to be doing rather than focusing on core blockchain because um, core blockchain is a, a very complex problem and you have to uh, incentivize security and then um, there's just like a lot of different incentives at play that um, a, a normal company might not understand that you know Polkadot kind of just provides right off the bat and I think you know that that's just extremely attractive for anyone that is trying to you know enter the space and, and utilize this technology. And, yeah. and also, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. But TJ, kind of adding to that, just like something that just popped to mind, maybe in like five to, to 10 years, right? We will be sitting here and kind of saying, you know what, it's like five years ago, we choose those app chains because we had a framework, right? And we hadn't had to start from scratch, right? So maybe in five years, actually, someone will be here and saying, well, yeah, I've used this like technology because, right, there are existing like governance chains out there, right, that are interoperable. There are different like DeFi chains out there that are interoperable, right? So like, I mean, we still have to worry about like building out our own governance, right? Although the framework gives us like a nice way of coding it, we still have to kind of like build it out ourselves sometimes and still have to tweak it, right? But actually maybe in the future, this kind of like idea revolves by like having even more like use case specific chains and so on right that you would use them right instead of basically going back to the framework so maybe in the future it will become actually even easier and you could use even more kind of like pre-built ideas um out there just something just came to mind i thought might be interesting to add to that yeah no i think the infrastructure um part of obviously like the substrate sdk and then um basically this cross-chain messaging and the arbitrary data transfer um allows for any anything to be built really like any any passing of data and um i think that's why like as we said like specific apps being built is probably going to be more likely in the future where it, it probably doesn't make sense to have 10 chains with 10 different money markets whereas that um, a, a dominant money market will probably have its own specific pair chain um as just through xcm messaging can can access liquidity or just field transactions from any chain. So, um, and I think that that, you know, solves for the liquidity fragmentation I was saying earlier, at least helps with it. Um, so, and that, that just allows the money market to, to optimize the chain for whatever it's trying to do. So I think, um, like you said, the framework is just gonna allow for, for all these other new use cases to, pop, to spring up. 100%. And on that note, we'll move to the last question. Just want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what do you guys think is some of the problems, uh, you know, with, with, you know, why aren't there more users uh, with things like mass adoption, like maybe specifically with Polkadot? Like, do you guys think it's the UI UX? Would you guys like to see more resources, uh, you know, be, be directed anywhere? Uh, just give us your final thoughts. And then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, we'll close with you all giving your final thoughts to like people actually building on Polkadot. But yeah, first let's talk a little bit about adoption and maybe uh, Adam, you can start. Like, what do you see as some of the pro problems or things that, that are holding back uh, people from using these applications? Um, yeah, so I think you, you started the, 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 this thing very, very well. So yeah, I do think that there is a problem with um, user experience in Polkadot ecosystem right now. Like, for example, a very good example of this is Polkadot.js. Um, this is, a, of course, more popular explorer and wallet in the ecosystem. And my opinion is that it's not a wallet that is that should be used by regular users. This is actually a developer tool more than a user uh, wallet. Right now, we do see uh, the new like sub wallet and, and Nova wallet, for example, the new world being built uh, with this in mind. And um, but still, I think for quite some time, Polkadot.js will be the one which is used mostly, and it has really complex. Uh, it offers a really complicated user experience. There's uh, way more features and options there than a regular user would be interested in ever clicking. And uh, to, to perform a simple actions, you, you are asked questions which are often not really understood by, uh, by the 
end users. So I think this is one of the signs of uh, of still uh, perhaps pretty early stage of the ecosystem. And we are just just entering the stage right now where uh, where we are um, building the user facing applications. Right now, it was the, the ecosystem was basically uh, caring mostly about attracting developers, which would uh, which would uh, build the user facing apps. Right just now, I think we are actually in the, in the stage where this this user facing uh, apps and your interfaces are, are starting to appear. This is the case also with. Uh, with Subscan, which is also an explorer, but much more targeting the actual regular users uh, than developers. So, uh, so yeah, I think this is, um, of course, this is an obstacle for for every uh, every blockchain right now. Um, like there is no um, blockchain wallet which would be so user friendly that a non crypto person could use it without uh, going through several tutorials and asking friends uh, whether it's safe what the person is doing. Um, but I think in Polkadot perhaps this problem is uh, slightly more prevalent than uh, than in uh, uh, in uh, I don't know let's say of course it's Europe but also uh, also perhaps Cosmos. Uh, so yeah, very much. I think that the biggest obstacle in adoption right now is uh, is the UX of uh, of the main uh, main tools. Yeah, well said. And I've heard other other people talk about yes, you have to focus on the developers first. And you're not the only one who brought up the criticism of Polkadot JS. So I think there's definitely some work to be done there. And excited to see, you know, but, what, what people do. Say, but Polkadot JS is is. But it's an amazing, uh, amazing application, just not for regular users. This is a very yeah. good tool for, for, for example, developers. And the yeah, it's like, it's even. yeah, it's like we got you got to get the developers first. Uh, obviously, they're like the, the the root, right? Like when you're just thinking of Ethereum and, and other other chains, it starts with the developers. But yes, for our audience watching this, anyone you know, people want to actually use use these applications for sure. I'll move to you next, uh, Fabian. Give us your closing thoughts here. For sure. Yeah, I would say let's if we would kind of separate like the users, right, to like end users and, and developers, right? I think for end users, the problem in general is that um, even like the use cases we have out there, which I, I would say mostly either like NFTs or DeFi, right, are not even like mainstream um use cases right i would say like i always have to say at conferences so like my, my mom right she would she would never use like a DeFi protocol right she would never use like ah like uh, an ama or, or things like that and then i also think that actually with the, the DeFi hype and everything happening actually the people made so much money with it anyways right it's like they weren't looking at the underlying technology right as, as i said it's like if you make 10k profit on a on a uniswap trade well and you pay 150 dollars in gas like why not right you're, you're, not, you're questioning like it's still a lot of money you're making profit on it and i think it's now kind of like time for us to build and then actually realize for the average DeFi user out there oh actually there is no need to pay 150 dollars in gas right or actually i could use like a dedicated app chain and i can use the exact same stuff even more optimized right more cheap and i think it will take some time until this is kind of like settling in right same with nfts i think nfts is pretty much torn towards like artists and musicians, which also would say isn't the biggest part of our society, right? So I think in general, crypto is lacking some like mainstream adoption in general, right? I think we're like absolutely getting there with kind of like those things coming in. Um, and if then from a developer standpoint, I mean, I can I can openly say why we, we have kind of decided against becoming a um, like a parachain or, the, or against kind of like building on a parachain, which I think might be might be interesting, which is first of all, that I said we were more Go native than, than Rust native. That's more kind of like as a development language decision. And then the other thing was the idea of a parachain with the shared security and the slots, right? This might actually be a UX problem for us, which we might didn't understand, but like no one could give us like a clear answer of what does happen if you would drop out of the slot system, right? The answer we got was, well, you're a para threat, right? But no one could really like explain to us like, how then how how is a para threat how would the migration process look like and so on and so on so like like a bunch of like unclear things so then kind of we decided you know let's, let's go with the the cosmos side of things we built our own security yet that's, that's something we, we do have to do right but then it's like kind of like our responsibility to that and kind of building that up right but i also of course do see the point of like well 
you can become a parachain, you can share the security. I think it's it's a great feature and something you wouldn't have to worry about, right? And maybe it's it's something where there is an easy answer to it, which we maybe as a team didn't found, right? I don't want to to, to, to blame it on anyone, but it's just something like, yeah, we, we just couldn't get like a clear kind of like picture of, I would say. For sure, there's like a lot of development going on right now. Everyone's still trying to understand the technology, but still bullish on people building. Um, TJ, you can take us out on this question and then I'll have you all give your final pieces of, of advice. Yeah, um, I guess in terms of like mainstream adoption, I think we definitely have mainstream awareness now, um, which probably couldn't have been said in 2017 or at least not to this extreme. You know, we have Super Bowl commercials and advertisements everywhere. But in terms of actually kind of onboarding these people, I think, um, you know, just on ramping capital is still uh, a difficult experience for some people. And um, even depending on like your location, some some people still might not be able to onboard capital. And then I think it's, it's definitely going to come from like the wallet perspective. I think, uh, you know, like Coinbase came out with the wallet, um, Phantom wallet, MetaMask wallet, the, basically like, almost like, I think someone said like there's a wallet wars about to break out where Everyone's racing to, you know, um, have the most daily active users and kind of how I see whatever wallet ends up winning is going to be through interfacing a lot of this existing stuff. So um, like the user's not going to know that they're interacting with blockchain A or blockchain B, but um, obviously there's going to be a lot of processes happening in the background where um, a user just has USD in their wallet and whatever chain they're interacting with is going to be uh, interoperable with whatever action they're trying to do. And that's going to kind of just allow for the user to, to kind of take whatever action they want um, without having to understand, you know, which bridge had a security or um, how much gas fees do I need and what gas limit do I need to set to, to make sure my transaction goes through, which um, for us crypto natives is probably like an extremely easy thing to understand, but for kind of a new user coming in, they're not going to understand that you could lose a hundred dollars uh, sending a transaction on Ethereum and it might not even go through. And that's just like money down the drain, which um, if, if I was a new user and that happened to me, I probably would just leave the industry because <laughs> I would be like, this is just like a waste of money. But um, I think just services that are able to abstract away that kind of complex backend structure of crypto and um, essentially have like a web two interface for what we're doing um, is going to kind of be the next step of bringing or onboarding new people to, you know, DeFi and NFTs and basically whatever other use cases crypto provides. I couldn't agree more. And that's why it was very great, like talking to you all, because it does start with the wallets and, and the infrastructure. Um, lastly, I just want you all uh, maybe keep it 30 seconds or less. Just give your parting advice to maybe new people building on Polkadot or new people just dabble, dabbling in, um, trying to build things. Um, I'll start with you, Fabian. Yeah, I think I think it would be that basically it's just like the, the perfect place to start, right? If, if you would look into that, it's kind of like do a bit of research, right? Have a look of kind of like what you are like using or what you what you're trying to optimize for, right? And kind of like try to get a clear picture of that. Make sure what kind of demands um, your app might have in terms of interoperability, right? It's like, what do you want to focus on? Are there maybe existing kind of like solutions out there? So you would kind of like try to, to really like optimize for that. Other than that, I would say it's a pretty smooth um, way to start. If, if, if you're a developer, um, things are pretty straight, straightforward, hop into it, get a feeling for it as you would start really kind of like any other project. It's not, it's not any, any other magic happening there. For sure. i um, move to you next, you next Adam. So uh, my advice would be, if you're a team thinking about setting up your own chain, don't even think about building it from scratch. I mean, really, <laughs> like take one of the existing frameworks and use it. Unless you are like a part of a big corporation with like unlimited resources, you, you, you don't want to build from scratch. Whether it's Polkadot or other, I mean, that's like uh, probably up to, 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 uh, to discussion, but you need to use something. Yeah, hundred percent. Can't argue with that advice. And lastly, TJ, take us out. Yeah, I, I was going to say basically exactly what Adam said is, um, if if you don't have to build like an entirely new chain, you definitely shouldn't. Um, 
you should definitely optimize for kind of your specific use case. And um, there's plenty of frameworks out there and basically try to tap into existing communities and existing um, tooling and infrastructure as much as possible. Cause otherwise uh, it's gonna, it's gonna take you a while to launch and, you know, get your product out there. For sure. Uh, great advice from all of you. And yeah, thank you all for your, for your time uh, here and for everyone watching, I suggest you connect with everyone here, rewatch this panel um, and stay tuned. We're still bringing you more interviews here at Reimagine V13. Uh, and again, I'm your host, Roshan Marachkar. Thank you, everyone.